Hello everyone. Uh, let's continue our uh, uh, classes on uh, causation of disease. So in this uh, session, I'll be covering about germ theory, epidemiological triad, multifactorial causation, and web of causation. The other few things like uh, natural history, risk factors, and spectrum of disease should be covered in future classes. Okay. So I spoke of disease we had covered in detail. Uh, so uh, there were a lot of theories um, present before the germ theory how the disease is caused all those theories were supernatural theory theory of humus humus means a bad products in uh, our body theory of contagion uh, theory of uh, miasma miasma is nothing but the bad air which causing disease and theory of spontaneous generation all these theories were conspiracy theories with not much uh, without any scientific evidences so one of the first uh, theory with scientific evidence was uh, germ theory so it was started when a uh, french bacteriologist uh, we know louis pasteur he found out uh, the presence of bacteria in air and he advanced the theory of spontaneous generation then after that period robert koch came into uh, the limelight of bacteriology so it is known as the golden era of bacteriology he found out uh, the anthrax caused by some bacteria uh, after that many bacteria were discovered gonococcus typhus uh, cholera diphtheria so at that point of time when germ theory was there people believe that or it was believed that a particular agent entering into man and causing a disease mostly microbes okay so robert koch uh, postulated a theory that is germ theory it is completely uh, emphasizing on the presence of microbes in producing a disease so he uh, with his scientific background he inoculated bacteria and produced infections so he had evidences so his postulates were a specific microorganism is always associated with a given disease because a disease is always caused by a microorganism and it can be isolated from a disease animal and it can also be grown in a laboratory and the grown uh, new microbe can cause and it can transfer to healthy animal and again it can be isolated from the animal so these were the course postulates a part of germ theory but the uh, theory had a limitation because it was unable to explain why some people suffer the disease after exposure to microorganism not all because not everyone is getting um, the microorganisms is not producing symptoms or not producing uh, disease that is tubercle bacilli so that is um, a bacteria of uh, tuberculosis so this was the main pro problem because some people carry the bacteria as carrier state without producing any symptoms okay so this lead to the formation of the second concept that is epidemiological triad because the tuberculosis was not able to explain by the theory germ theory and course postulates because even after having presence of microbes all the people are not producing uh, symptoms or not having any disease so the germ theory was rejected and the second one or the next theory that is epidemiological or ecological triad theory came into existence because uh, it need to be an interaction of agent environment and host or the imbalance of these three factors can cause a disease like tuberculosis okay so the epidemiological triad there should be an imbalance between these three factors agent means the our tuberculosis bacilli environment means the environment uh, which where the uh, person is living and host is the immunity factors or the host factors so all these factors has has to be compiled for a, uh, for this disease to be uh, happen so before the germ theory was explaining only this part of the epidemiological triad now we have to uh, concentrate on environmental and host factors 
So agent is something which is coming from outside. It can be biological, mechanical, nutrition, like deficiency or physical or chemical agent. And host factors, it depends upon the genetics, age, gender, its literacy level, its income, lifestyle, immunity. Everything has a contributing factor for the disease. And the environment, it's depend upon the customs he follows psychological factors biological factors and physical factors so all these three factors that is environmental agent and host factors has a role in producing a disease that is epidemiological trial uh, so the equilibrium should be lost or the equilibrium should be disrupted for the disease to be happen so this model explains that some persons do not suffer from the disease even though they harbor the pathogens which was not able to explain by the germ theory but the problem arises when it is not applicable for non-infectious and chronic diseases like coronary heart diseases mental illness and such diseases where the disease is caused by multiple factors so this has to lead to the next theory or next concept as is multifactorial causation of disease that is a disease is caused by many factors so it was first introduced by uh, Gallen in one, uh, 130, 150 AD. It was very uh, ago. Uh, then in uh, Pittenkofer of Germany also introduced this theory during this era of 19th century, but it was overshadowed by the germ theory because that was the golden era of bacteriology because uh, all these factors like social, economic, culture and psychological factors has to be there for a disease to be uh, produced. So otherwise the disease will not happen, especially the cro chronic type and the lifestyle diseases because it is uh, uh, factors which uh, factors like poverty, illiteracy, ignorance and poor living conditions, overcrowding all will contribute to the disease. So tuberculosis is not just uh, due to a bacteria, it is also due to poverty, overcrowding and malnutrition. So uh, the modern diseases are the diseases of civilization like lung cancer, diabetes, coronary heart disease, mental illness are mainly due to the multiple factors or the multifactorial causation. So, we know that for example excess of fat uh, intake and smoking lack of physical exercise obesity are all involved in pathogenesis of coronary heart disease we just cannot point out a single factor all factors have uh, its contribution in producing this disease so that is the um, multifactorial uh, disease it is also comes under a broad aspect of epidemiological triad because we can put all these factors into epidemiological factors like positive factors, environmental, cultural, other factors and the host factors. It is a different version of the same epidemiological triad. Okay, that is uh, about the multifactorial causation. And the last one is web of causation, a little more complicated uh, concept because this model of disease suggested by McMahon and Puck and this model is basically suited for chronic diseases because the same diseases which we were explaining multifactorial this is little more advanced okay so this is like a lot of factors which has intricate relationship between each other and we cannot just point out a one factor or two factor because all factors are interrelated and giving a complex relationship and producing the disease we can just take an example of myocardial infarction. So basic factors are changes in lifestyle, smoking and stress. Stress is causing emotional disturbance which is ultimately releasing hypertension and it causes walls of artery changes and it gives coronary fusion. At the same time aging also causes hypertension. At the same time changes in lifestyle, lot of food habit, the obesity, it also results in hypertension and obesity also results in hyperlipidemia that results in atherosclerosis that also goes to the coronary occlusion so all these factors are interrelated we just cannot put these factors into a triangle shape so it is just like a, a web uh, 
uh, of all factors which is interrelated and causing the disease so this is what exactly uh, nowadays we are following in the chronic diseases or lifestyle diseases rather than multifactorial disease causation this is almost like multifactorial but the interrelation is more specific in this web so today's session we will be seeing about iceberg phenomenon so in the cover pic uh, i have put a picture of a iceberg um, which caused destruction of the unsinkable ship titanic so that's the idea of iceberg so why the um, ship sank because uh, the captain of the ship couldn't see the underwater portion of this iceberg he was just seeing the above water level and he tried to turn the ship but what happened was the lower decks uh, hit with the underwater portion of iceberg and it sank so that's the idea of iceberg phenomena so let's apply this idea into uh, disease so in today's class i'll be talking about iceberg phenomena in disease so as we know iceberg is a piece of ice that is broken off from snow the main uh, point is just one ninth volume of an iceberg is seen above the water so that means the majority the 90 percentage of the iceberg is below the water so we'll apply the iceberg phenomena into concept of causation so we have a lot of uh, concepts that is epidemiological triad multifactorial natural history of disease web of causation risk factors spectrum of disease so uh, today's session will be covering just iceberg of disease so all these sessions will be covered in future classes so let's see what is iceberg of disease so it is just a metaphor uh, which uh, says that every health problem uh, as a known case and an unknown case so in a, if we take a population if we take a country we are checking any particular disease uh, let's take uh, diabetes or let's say cardiac disease uh, there is a very small portion which is very visible uh, the non cases the people who are diagnosed with the diabetes people who are taking treatment or pe people who are taking insulin or under uh, other medications and there is a lot of majority they are not diagnosed they, they are just there in the uh, society they are around us just being undiagnosed that is the concept of iceberg okay majority of the people are undiagnosed only very few are diagnosed so we'll just uh, go into detail of an iceberg the floating tip of an iceberg represents the clinical cases that is the non case what the physician sees the non cases because they might express some symptoms so they go to the clinician and they diagnosed as diabetes the submerged portion that is the vast portion represents the hidden mass of disease that is they are not showing any symptoms so they are not being diagnosed they might be diagnosed accidentally when they go for checkup for any other routine blood checkup or any other thing that time they will come to the tip of iceberg otherwise they will be submerged because they are pre-symptomatic most of the time and they are undiagnosed cases or the carriers of community that is submerged portion <coughs> sorry let's take uh, the example of uh, coronavirus uh more we screen the patients more the cases we get because ma majority are still being undiagnosed or act as a carrier in our society so the more tests we do the more cases we get uh the what we are seeing now is just the tip of an iceberg the majority of the cases are submerged okay so more actively we do screening more cases and the tip of the iceberg will be more more and more visible so the water line represents the demarcation between apparent and unapparent cases that is clinical and undiagnosed cases and patients who are at the tip of iceberg are more likely to have very uh, severe health problems because more and more it goes to the tip the severity and the morbidity are more and more it is going on a higher fashion and as we go down to the uh, iceberg the patient becoming more and more healthy okay but they will be gradient of uh, disease so just see the let's break down this iceberg you can see the tip uh, the disease diagnosed and controlled 
at this water level diagnosed but it is uncontrolled they know that they have disease but they are not under medication and whatever is below the water line is undiagnosed or wrongly diagnosed uh, some may have the risk factors some may are exposed to a lot of uh, diabetic uh, prone uh, food items and majority uh, that is free of risk factors this part so that's what i was uh, uh, saying as you go to the tip of the iceberg you will have a lot of problems when you go down so you are more likely to be healthy okay so the block one and two corresponds to the iceberg these two are the iceberg and this is the submerged portion so underwater is unidentified cases are they are very different from identified cases because their spectrum and natural history is very different and symptoms and uh, progression uh, since it is related the undiagnosed cases are likely to be less severe okay so uh, that's the idea of iceberg it is not very uh, very uh, crucial thing uh, it is uh, identifying uh, the undiagnosed cases from a population that is it basically uh, stress the emphasis the screening part of a disease because it is not very contagious uh, diseases mostly uh, hidden it will be mostly chronic or lifestyle diseases so when we do more uh, screening and we get more diseases we can reduce the morbidity uh, of that particular disease okay so let's uh, see the scenario of caries so we know what is caries so this is a caries iceberg so this tip of this caries these two blocks are the diagnosed caries okay so this is lesions which involved into a pulp and this is uh, the little severe uh, cases and these are caries involved to enamel and this is just uh, beginning lesions and they are subclinical lesions or free of caries so these are we are treating uh, these people because these people are coming to dentist or for a dental treatment these people are uh, having diseases but they are not coming to de uh, dentist or a dent for a dental treatment because of their unawareness or uh, they are not uh, producing any symptoms so this is case of um, dental caries iceberg so our uh, idea is the clinician or a uh, researcher or a uh, health uh, sector people what we need to do is we have to uh, bring more and more cases from the underwater to tip of the iceberg so they can uh, get a treatment so as early we find the disease at the bottom level they will not uh, go to the severe state because anyway when the disease is coming from this to this to this they'll turn up to the clinician or a dentist so our idea is to detect the cases as early as possible so we can uh, give them a better prognosis so this is about the treatment uh, part so early we diagnose the disease that is part of screening the better will be the prognosis so here we can do preventive uh, care but uh, this part of the preventive care is not uh, possible so if we diagnose the patient here by help of screening we can do preventive treatment rather than and just like a pit and fissure serum so fluoride instead of big restrictions and other pulp therapy okay so if we see the periodontitis uh, iceberg so we know that uh, the iceberg what the patients are coming with uh, symptoms just like loosened tooth or the tooth elongation where the bone support is lost so our idea is to um, conduct uh, more and more uh, radiographs and other clinical aids and find out the gingival recession bleeding gums and pocket cases so that uh, they get better prognosis they diagnosed at the very early stages of disease so get a better prognosis so they don't uh, eventually turn up to the tip of the disease we have to pick them up uh, underwater and give the treatment so that they don't turn up here so this is automatically uh, patients with symptoms so we need to find out people without symptoms by active screening and give them better treatment to uh, get a prognosis so similarly in oral cancer 
people uh, turn up only with symptoms just like chewing problems uh, difficulty in swallowing or other tongue problems oh so we need to uh, do aspiration biopsy and other procedures and find out the uh, cancers at early stages okay and uh, active screening will uh, find out the underwater uh, diseases i mean the asymptomatic or uh, diseases which is not having a very severe severity okay. so that's the idea of iceberg phenomena so iceberg phenomena is all about uh, detecting uh, the underwater diseases or the asymptomatic diseases by active screening so a clinician cannot do active screening it is uh, uh, epidemiologist or uh, other community medicine people or community uh, dentist or community or uh, doctors they can go to the public and do active screening they can do examination on apparent healthy people and find out the disease because uh, not all cases will show symptoms some will not show symptoms and they produce symptoms at very late stage of the disease so we need to do active screening on the apparent healthy people and find out the cases before they actually show symptoms so we can uh, reduce the morbidity of such cases and such patients okay so that's the idea of iceberg phenomena so i'll come up with the other uh, concept of causation in my next classes so thank you in our session on concept of causation so so far we have covered germ theory epidemiological triad multifactorial causation web of causation and iceberg of disease so the remaining portions that is natural history of disease uh, risk factors and spectrum of disease okay so these three topics will be covered from to today's session so let's uh, move on to the natural history of disease so natural history of disease is nothing but suppose what happens when a pathogen enters our body that is before the before the stage that is pre pathogenesis state that is when we are exposed to a place where there are chances of pathogen entry and to a state where the pathogen can cause its full on effect to our body so in definition we can say that a disease evolves over time from the earliest stage of its pre pathogenesis phase to its termination okay so when it has shows its full effect that is this pathogen has shows its full effect it results in either recovery disability or death usually in absence of treatment or prevention we are not doing anything suppose we are not doing anything to prevent that pathogen control of pathogen what will be the cause of this pathogen's action how do this pathogen react or present in our body so that is natural history of disease usually when pathogen enters the symptoms arise we go to doctor or we take treatment and it will be cured or with maybe some disability will be there so what if we are not doing any prevention or any treatment so it might end up recovery disability or death so that is a natural history of any disease so the process begins like when we are going to a place or when we are at a risk of getting an infection suppose we are going to a slum where the epidemic of cholera is around or in the air i mean uh, in the water so we are exposed to Mm, or this cholera bacteria and we are having a high chance of getting this bacteria through, through water or any other way but we have not yet uh, shown this uh, pathogen entry the way for pathogen entry the pathogen is still outside the body okay so that is pre pathogenesis phase but any moment this pathogen can enter and once it enter it starts the pathogenesis phase because pathogen enters body and it starts replicating and it shows its uh, effect 
so that is pathogenesis and pre-pathogenesis phase so if there is no medical intervention what happens is as i told there will be either disability or death or there will be recovery the body immune system itself shows recovery you will fight against the pathogen and the body will be recovered so what happens is the pathogen exposure we are going in a place where we get exposed pathogen enters the host body it results in disease there is no intervention it may end up either death disability or recovery so this process is known as natural history of disease there is no intervention here okay so usually natural history of disease can be studied in a cohort study so we know cohort study is a prospective or future looking study it studies study starts with a uh, disease free person and it goes and over a future period of time the person develops a disease so the best way to study natural history of disease is cohort study but since it's we know it is very laborious uh, and it is costly so mostly it is done by other methods like cross-sectional and retrospective like case control study but best way is always cohort study because we can uh, understand that how the disease uh, shows its uh, clear effect because when we start the study there is no disease so over the period we will be knowing very clearly how the disease shows its effect but if you are doing a retrospective study the disease has already done its all uh, effect on the people or the particular person so we will be asking questions and trying to find out what would have done so it is not very accurate as we get the information during a cohort study so uh, the physician what physician sees in clinic is just an episode of a natural history of disease so we go to uh, a doctor when we get symptoms when we get fever when we get a headache or when we have feeling when we feel tiredness uh, fatigue for such symptoms we go to the uh, physician or a doctor so that is just part of or just an episode of the natural history of disease so natural history of disease can be studied only by an epidemiologist so a clinician or a doctor cannot study the natural history of disease it should be studied by an epidemiologist how it starts how it goes and what are the symptom it shows and how it uh, finishes its course by recovery disability or death so we can divide the natural history of disease uh, as pre-pathogenic and pathogenic pre-pathogenic is before the pathogen enters the body but we are at a risk of getting the pathogen once the pathogen enters our body pathogenic phase starts okay So pre-pathogenic says, as I mentioned earlier, we are at a condition where the disease or the, where the pathogen can enter our body at any time, but it is not yet entered. Okay. So that is a pre-pathogenesis phase, of many communicable and non-communicable disease. Communicable disease like cholera, food poison, we are at a position where any time we can get the pathogen, like we are going to a restaurant where the food poison have been reported any moment we get the pathogen we are at a area where the cholera has been reported we get any moment the disease or the pathogen enters our body so that is pre-pathogenesis phase okay because pathogen hasn't entered our body so i'm exposed to the risk of the disease because there is a risk of disease all these places so we are at a risk of this is but we are not infected with the pathogen so next is pathogenic phase when the pathogen or organism enters our body when this clostridium bottle that is a food poison causing bacteria or vibrio cholerae enters our body the pathogenic phase starts it shows symptoms it can be clinical or subclinical because we know uh, many people with coronavirus it's not showing any symptoms but they are under pathogenic phase 
we are all now it since it is a pandemic we are all living in pre pathogenesis phase because everywhere there is case present we may get the disease from uh, any person so we are all under pre pathogenic phase that's only a, a case for such pandemic diseases once it enters it becomes pathogenesis so clinical or subclinical let it be but it is a, a pathogenic phase so the pathogenic phase decides basically the fate of the disease how it ended up with the outcome can be recovery disability or death okay so we can summarize the natural history of disease by this picture this is a cause of this pathogen okay how it shows its effect on our body and these two phases one is pre pathogenesis phase and this is pathogenesis phase okay so we are living in a area where any time the pathogen can enter our body that is pre pathogenesis phase we are living in a slum or we are going to a restaurant that is pre pathogenesis phase this particular organism enters our body the pathogenesis phase starts once it start it might be asymptomatic or it is symptomatic if it is symptomatic will go to a doctor or a uh, physician and we'll get it diagnosed okay so diagnosis can be done only at clinical stage a symptomatic uh, stage no diagnosis is very difficult so it may end up death disability or recovery because we are not doing any treatment here this is just a natural history of disease this diagnosis is possible under clinical stage because patient will show symptoms okay so that is uh, all about natural history of disease how a disease progresses without any medical treatment or any intervention or any prevention how it goes and how it shows its full effect on it as a death disability or recovery so studying natural history of disease is very much important in prevention of disease okay so natural history of disease is over next is the spectrum of disease this is almost like mm, our natural history so it says that it is a graphic representation so you can see that uh, we know spectrum of color when a light uh, enters the prism it uh, radiates many colors or oh, that that's why it got this name spectrum of disease so spectrum of disease it's a graphic representation of variations in the manifestation of disease so one disease can present uh, various uh, outcome sometimes oh, a particular disease might be asymptomatic in a particular person it might be symptomatic but very mild stage sometimes it will be in a moderate stage sometimes the same disease can be very fatal for that next person so various manifestations are present for the same disease so that is all about spectrum of disease a healthy person a particular disease showing various manifestations okay so at one end that is this end the person is having positive health because that particular disease is not showing any problem for that particular uh, that uh, patient okay at one end of the spectrum are subclinical infection suppose if we take uh, tuberculosis many of the indian population are carriers they are not showing any symptoms still they harbor microorganisms in their body so they are under subclinical infection and uh, they are not having any uh, problems as such because positive health better health and the other end is death the same disease can cause uh, death of a person they are very malnourished they are living in uh, overcrowded uh, slum areas the same disease can cause death of that person okay so at one end it will be positive and better health and the other extreme end it shows as sim as a death so at one end the spectrum are subclinical infection and the other end it is uh, fatal illness so in the middle it is having uh, illness ranging in severity that is mild to moderate this area will be mild to moderate so spectrum of disease is nothing but a disease manifestations in various people uh, ranging from positive health to death 
so next we uh, go to iceberg we have already covered next you go to the risk factors risk factors are very much important in the present scenario because all most of the diseases which were present in the past century like cholera uh, that contagious diseases other contagious diseases like uh, smallpox plague all are under well control because our uh, scientific uh, knowledge and our medical facilities are improved uh, to a very extent that all these contagious diseases can be uh, well controlled though exceptions are there like uh, corona pandemic still all the contagious diseases can be well controlled but what happens is the other side of uh, disease that is chronic diseases or lifestyle diseases are on a increasing fashion because uh, due to the change in lifestyle or due to change in the food habit or sedentary lifestyle the people are uh, getting affected with many lifestyle diseases like coronary heart disease diabetes obesity high cholesterol so all these uh, are risk factors we can say because we just cannot say to we know that tuberculosis caused by mycobacterium tuberculae okay in many diseases we cannot say what causes what because in multifactorial and web of causation we have seen how the chronic diseases or lifestyle diseases are exposed there are many factors which are intricate relationship causing the disease so risk factors are coming into uh, the limelight in this 21st century for the past uh, 30 50 years where the lifestyle of people have changed drastically so risk factors are nothing but an attribute that significantly associated with the development of a disease let's take smoking so this attribute has significantly associated with causing lung cancer so it can be called as a risk factor anything which has a significant effect on producing something increased probability of causing something is known as risk factor so it can be modified by intervention or reduce the possibility of occurrence so we can do preventive measures we can educate the people and uh, risk factors can be modified uh, and it is always modifiable some risk factors are not modifiable like our genetic makeup our chromosomal abnormalities our immune system such things are not modifiable risk factors but many risk factors like uh, heating practices sedentary lifestyle uh, the smoking alcoholism so such things can be modified and the outcome will be uh, changed so risk factors are suggestive but not absolute proof that is the difference between uh, our germ theory and the recent web of causation germ theory says this bacteria causes this disease but in risk factors we cannot give that much assurance or absolute proof is not possible it can give a suggestive suggestive power only it it can cause this disease smoking can uh, cause uh, lung cancer we cannot say that smoking causes lung cancer because many people with lung cancer uh, smoking might not be a very significant factor because uh, we don't have that much evidence a perfect hundred percentage evidence because most of diseases are due to the web of causation so that is the risk factor so so risk factors are many times modifiable and non-modifiable are the modifiable are the which is coming in our daily practices and non-modifiable risk factors are also there so risk factors are commonly associated with our um, lifestyle diseases so we have covered uh, our most of the concept of causation so i'll just uh, we'll just have a recap so germ theory we covered epidemiological triad multifactorial nature and web of causation these two are coming into our chronic or lifestyle diseases then the natural history of disease how the disease uh, be presented without any intervention and it has pre-pathogenesis and pathogenesis phase iceberg of disease we know what is the tip and what is underwater and spectrum of disease how the spectrum of uh, disease showing from perfect health to death and the risk factors and risk group and risk group we know people who follows risk factors and there will be many risk groups because if we say uh, 
uh, contagious diseases we, we can uh, say that the slum people or overcrowded people are mostly the risk group for getting that disease people who are under smoking habit is a risk group for lung cancer or other emphysema such diseases so there will be always risk group and age old people will be at risk for um, schizophrenia parkinson's disease so risk groups uh, should be taken care of well so this is all about concept of causation so i covered it uh, all the various uh, concepts how the disease is getting uh, disease is caused uh, from the 18th century and prior some diseases theories were there and to the very recent ones so the present uh, present stage we are mostly seeing this risk factors and risk groups risk factors are the main thing and web of causation or multifactorial causation so uh, the next class i will be covering the prevention of disease the levels of prevention okay so uh, that's all about concept of causation so thank you hello everyone welcome back to a new session on dentistry and more so today we will be covering the concept of prevention so the last session we had covered concept of causation so how the disease is caused we had covered all the theories and all the concepts so now we will be moving on to the concepts of prevention how do we prevent a disease and what are the concepts available on what levels we are going to prevent a particular disease so that uh, we are going to see in this particular session so just like benjamin franklin said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure always prevention is better than cure so in our country the third world countries or developing countries all, all may always keep on to the curative part rather than the preventive part Curative part or curative medicine is always uh, very expensive. It might break the backbone of a uh, individual or a family. But the problem is the preventive side of medicine or preventive aspect is not much given importance in our country compared to the Western countries. So prevention is always better than cure. So what is prevention? Prevention, we know the word itself says pre-event action. It's just like stopping an action. Because the action of stopping something from happening. Okay. So we are going to prevent something. It's very simple as that. Prevent pre-event action. So we are going to prevent a certain action that might cause a disease when we apply this to or disease prevention smoking causes lung cancer so we are preventing an action of smoking so that it won't result in lung cancer so let's see what are the levels of prevention so basically we have four levels so we prevent diseases under this four level that is primordial prevention primary secondary and tertiary it depends on the complexity if we see the disease the disease is not it occurred here and tertiary prevention the disease as shows is complete effect okay so it is going by disease severity so in true sense we can say that primordial and primary are true sense of prevention because after primary prevention the disease already are into action so we are just limiting the or halting the progress of disease in primordial and primary the disease is not yet occurred so we are preventing Actually the disease so let's move on to the primordial prevention so primordial prevention is newly emerged concept of prevention it is nothing but preventing the occurrence or preventing the occurrence of a habit or a risk factor just like uh, the smoking causes lung cancer we are educating students or we are teaching some uh, young people that the smoking causes lung cancer so that they don't acquire this risk factor that is primordial prevention the primary prevention is different primary prevention is like the particular individual or a group of people is already having the habit but we are modifying the risk factor so that they won't get a lung cancer or they won't get a disease modifying the risk factor and preventing the occurrence of risk factor is different so the primordial prevention is preventing the occurrence of a risk factor how we uh, how do we do that 
by establishing a social, economic and cultural pattern so that they won't have a habit at least. That is a risk factor. So that is primordial prevention. Primordial prevention is prevention in the very early stage. So we know that primordial prevention is just like uh, this is coronary heart disease or uh, arterial occlusion. So what we can do is we can prevent the intake of meats. We don't take meat at all or we teach the people not to use meat or red meat. Controlling the red meat is primary prevention, primary prevention whereas abstinence, complete removal from the diet or complete removal of the risk factor is primordial prevention. So primary prevention as I told you, the person is already having a habit or a risk factor for a particular disease. So it is by definition actions taken prior to the onset of disease. In primordial and primary disease is not yet occurred. So what all the actions we taken prior to the onset of disease which removes the possibility of that disease will never occur. So suppose a person is under smoking. He has been smoking for few months or few years. So we are going to uh, give a tobacco cessation counselling. He has not yet developed any disease or any lung cancer or anything. So we are going to educate him. We are going to modify his habit or a risk factor so that he won't get the disease. That is primary prevention. Primordial is we are educating the people not to smoke. Primary is we are modifying the smoking habit by educating. So this is primary prevention and it will be always at the pre-pathogenesis phase of a disease. Natural history we had seen pre-pathogenesis and pathogenesis. Pre-pathogenesis we speak the disease is not yet occurred. The pathogen is not yet entered. The risk factor is not yet entered into the body. Or the particular person is not yet acquired the particular risk factor. So it is always at the pre-pathogenesis phase of a disease or a health problem. So we modify it. We, uh, we educate, we modify it, uh, we promote health so that uh, the patient uh, will change the habit or reduce the habit or control the habit so that he won't acquire the disease. So it is all about a concept of positive health, this uh, primary prevention. So we can uh, just see that high serum cholesterol, you know, it causes coronary heart disease. So we ask them to control the uh, diet or we put them on a diet because we ask them to control his uh, consumption of red meat or any other oily stuff. So the risk factor is controlled or modified so that he won't get the coronary heart disease. So that is a primary prevention. So it is also like quantums are preventing HIV infections and immunizations preventing uh, diseases like uh, polio. Uh, BCG vaccine, all the vaccination which we give to uh, children to prevent diseases, all are primary prevention. So there are basically two types of primary prevention, one is mass approach and high risk approach. That is one is group approach, population approach. We have to apply to a big group of people. We have to modify our decisions so that it will benefit a, a very large group of people that is mass approach high risk group strategies we have to focus on a very particularly uh, risk groups okay so population app strategies directed towards the whole population irrespective of the risk level so whole population it will apply directly to the uh, whole population just like the ads or the health education uh, videos we seen before the movies against uh, tobacco so it is applying to everyone, every group of individual is seeing, kids, adults, males, females, everyone is seeing it. So that is a population strategy, just like a small level reduction in the blood pressure or a cholesterol level. It can reduce a incidence of coronary heart disease on a very large scale because we are applying it on a very group, big group of people. So if it has an, a, a very small effect, the outcome will be very drastic, very big outcome will be there because it is applying on a very big group of population or a big uh, group of people. 
so that is the uh, population strategy might not be very effective but the next strategy will be effective that is high risk strategy we have to select the people with special risk or high risk example smoking cessation programs should be applied to smokers because we apply the population strategy on every people we apply it to people those who are not smoking uh, but it might not be effective they won't take it very uh, seriously but when we apply it to very special group those who are in need that is smoking cessation should be on smokers that is high risk strategy so population strategy and high risk strategy are part of primary prevention so next is secondary and tertiary the disease is already occurred now we are going to limit the uh, impact of this disease that is secondary and tertiary so secondary is just like halt the progress of a disease at the very early stage and prevent the complication so secondary stage just like if we take a dental caries dental caries is already occurred we are going to restore it and to get back to its function that is mastication that is secondary prevention we take dental caries primary prevention we have to go for a fluoride therapy or pit and fissure resilience because the dental caries will not occur secondary prevention is like we are treating the disease primordial prevention the same scenario we apply we are teaching the students or we are educating not to eat chocolates or to brush twice that is primordial prevention can also come under primary prevention so the risk factor modification and risk factor prevention is different primordial and primary so but the secondary prevention is we are modifying the disease impact so we are treating the disease or we are preventing the disease at a very early stage so that it won't get complicated and result in uh, more morbidity so secondary prevention is uh, most commonly it's based on the natural history of disease if the particular disease has very long natural history we can uh, get the patient at a very early stage just like a uh, cancer treatment for a cancer patient we cast the patient at a very early stage we can reduce the uh, complications and we can save the patient so the tertiary prevention is like we are just disability limitation the disease has caused its full impact the tooth dental caries has caused uh, the tooth destruction like tooth become non-vital the crown is completely destroyed so that you you can't use it for the basic masticatory function so what you do you limit the disability and rehabilitate so you do pulp capping or root canal treatment and you rehabilitate with uh, partial danger uh, fixed partial danger crowns implants or other things so it is disability limitation and rehabilitation now prevention it's not at all a prevention in sets since we are treating all these under different different levels this is tertiary prevention so we can say that it is just a disability limitation and rehabilitation it is a measure to reduce or limit the impairment and disability and minimize the suffering. So that is the tertiary prevention. Just like rehabilitation of patients with poliomyelitis, strokes, we are rehabilitating with equipments and blindness, injuries. So enabling them to take part in a social life, not in a regular way. At least they can take part with the equipments or with the uh, rehabilitative measures we provide so that is tertiary prevention so this is uh, primary prevention like uh, we are educating with signboards asking uh, to wear helmets so this is secondary prevention these two are primary prevention secondary prevention accident has already occurred these both are to prevent accident so these two are two components of primary prevention that is health education and specific protection this is secondary prevention accident occurred but we are taking as early as possible and this is tertiary after the accident amputation of limb happened so we are replacing it and we are giving rehabilitation we are providing a wheelchair or any artificial leg so that is tertiary prevention social rehabilitation vocational and medical rehabilitation so the primary prevention is to teach them not to 
prevent not to have an accident secondary prevention they have accident but we take them as early as possible so that the complications will be less tertiary prevention it has full-on effect of complication and now we can't do anything now we just rehabilitate the patient so that's all about the prevention so primordial primary secondary and tertiary preventions so primary and primordial are true sense of prevention secondary and tertiary are the management of the disease complications so that's all about levels of prevention uh, next class i'll come up with uh, modes of intervention how do we apply this levels of prevention in practice so various methods in preventive measures okay. so mm, that's all about levels of prevention thank you class uh, will be on modes of intervention so in the last sessions we had covered uh, causes concepts of causation and then comes the concepts of prevention so it is uh, like a continuum it is uh, all goes in the same line so when the disease is uh, happening it comes under concept of causation there are various theories and how do we prevent it so what are the uh, preventive strategies that is levels and concepts of prevention and the next one is modes of intervention so that is how do we apply this uh, preventive strategies that's what we are discussing today modes of intervention so it is nothing but the levels of prevention but what are the measures we take what are the particular steps in levels of prevention okay so modes of intervention basically has five steps which is uh, uh, five steps which will be into three levels of prevention the first two steps that is health promotion and specific protection it comes under primary prevention the second pre secondary prevention is early diagnosis and treatment and the tertiary prevention is disability limitation and rehabilitation so let's uh, go into detail about the health promotion that is coming under primary prevention so primordial prevention is not mentioning here so the primary prevention that is the truest uh, sense of prevention where the disease is not yet occurred okay so let's see what is uh, in health promotion so health promotion is just like uh, promoting so we need to promote health just like uh, we promote our products we promote uh, people promote uh, their movies their books their songs just like we need to promote health so health promotion is nothing but they all together uh, compiled uh, compiled movement of the social uh, health administrative political and all together come into action to promote health not a single factor can alone do this health promotion so it has to be a multi-sectoral or inter-sectoral coordination for this health promotive activities so let's see what is in health promotion the steps are the activities are health education environmental modifications nutritional interventions lifestyle and behavioral changes so all of the life sectors has to be uh, come into the action for promoting health so what is health education it's nothing but educating people about health why you need to uh, why you need to keep hygiene all the time why you need to get the uh, profile access uh, what are the causes of this disease and how this disease spreads so that you can prevent the disease uh, why you need to wash your hands before and after uh, food or uh, washroom so all these things we need to teach them so then only they can follow it so if they know the pathogenesis the etiology of particular disease they can prevent the disease so educating uh, people about health is uh, a part of health promotion and that comes under primary prevention so the second part is uh, environmental modification even if we keep ourselves very hygiene, very aware of the health, what if uh, the water we drink or we get from outside is uh, very filthy and it is containing uh, coliform bacteria? So we can't help it. So the environment also should be very health promoting. So we should be able to get uh, safe drinking water. There should be proper sanitary latrines 
and there should be control of insects and rodents and there should be a good housing facilities so that's why i was saying uh, it should be a multifactorial or intersectoral approach as an individual as a person i cannot be always healthy if my environment my surroundings is very uh, filthy or it is polluted so even if i being very conscious or very aware of the health there is no point so environmental modification is must then the nutritional interventions that's why government is providing nutrients for uh, under five age uh, in various uh, schemes like midday meal scheme icds schemes through angan bodies and all this uh, that is to uh, prevent uh, certain uh, diseases like uh, malnourishment uh, and uh, protein, protein uh, nutrients and uh, vitamin deficiencies so we give it at a very early stage so that they don't develop the disease at all so nutritional intervention is part of health promotion it's just like vulnerable groups uh, there are programs for vulnerable groups like uh, pregnant women lactating women and their underage uh, under 5 age children so food fortification nutritional education child feeding program all these are coming under health promotion Uh, the second part of health promotion is specific protection uh, in first part we are doing everything in general uh, aspect but second part is specific protection we have to be very specific just like immunization we know immunization is against polio uh, mmr vaccine mumps measles rubella then the hepatitis vaccine japanese encephalitis vaccine so all these are particularly or specifically against a particular disease so that is a specific protection and use of specific nutrients to prevent a specific disease we are providing vitamin b to prevent uh, anemia or iron and uh, calcium tablet to prevent anemia so such uh, things nutrients and cream of prophylaxis and protection against occupational hazards we know we wear the helmets when go to a work site protection against accidents we promote uh, using helmets and seat belts uh similarly avoidance of allergens allergens and protection from carcinogens so it comes under health promotion also under primary prevention and it is a part of health promotion that is specific protection we are specifically doing uh, works against um, certain diseases or certain injuries or certain accidents to prevent such accidents or diseases so this comes under secondary prevention that is early diagnosis and treatment so the secondary prevention is we cannot say that it is truest uh, sense because i had mentioned in the last class that the truest prevention is primary and primordial because the disease has not yet occurred but in secondary prevention disease is just started or disease is going the progress we need to halt we need to stop the progress of disease so as early as we need to find out the disease okay so the screening of disease is very much important in this section we should find out the disease people or the disease at very early stage so that it won't result much of the morbidity so it won't create much of the problem for people so if it is a cancer we need to go to population and we need to do active screening of uh, various types of cancer so that we can Uh, find out cancers in very apparently healthy people so that they get a better uh, treatment at a very early stage and they'll have a very good prognosis what if it goes a very late stage and we diagnose it at a very late stage the prognosis will be very uh, poor so early diagnosis and adequate or prompt treatment it is a part of secondary prevention so that is secondary prevention it comes early diagnosis and third part treatment the number 3 this is part of the first one was health promotion and specific protection it comes under primary prevention early diagnosis and treatment the three comes under secondary prevention and the last part is uh, tertiary prevention it has two section one is disability limitation and rehabilitation the tertiary prevention in the sense the disease has caused its full effect the person is suffering person is disabled Uh, if we take dental caries tooth is non vital tooth has lost tooth is uh, not able to do a mastication people has lost a limb people has lost eye has lost ear something like that so we need to limit the disability okay so here 
it is reported at very late pathogenesis phase the pathogen or the particular problem has shown its full effect uh, now only uh, available option is limiting the disability so objective is to prevent the transition of disease from impairment to handicap so let it not go to a stage of handicap okay so handicap means a socially is not able to perform the duties uh, if he's a athlete if he lose uh, his leg means uh, his socially his uh, his job is uh, completely stopped if he's a uh, like surgeon he lost his fingers due to some accident he can't do a surgery anymore so that handicap should not happen so it should be uh, stopped at a very early uh, transition stage that impairment to handicap so let's take an example we'll get an idea this is a concept of disability disease happens then there will be impairment then disability handicap let's see an example the disease is frostbite okay so when it comes in contact with very low temperature what happens is the person lost his two fingers okay so frostbite is disease impairment is losing two fingers so disabilities is cannot do surgery that is his disability He's not able to do the surgery what happened the handicap thing is he can't become a surgeon so that surgeon what is missing here he can't become surgeon so that is the handicap uh, portion of uh, the cycle so we need to stop it at least this stage let uh, it not become a socially uh, handicap if it's become handicap you need to be uh, rehabilitated with with artificial processes and he need to be uh, accompanied with helpers so that stage should not happen so tertiary prevention is always aiming at disability limitation so we need to limit the disability and let it not go to the handicap stage so rehabilitation is nothing but we need to rehabilitate the people or the person who has suffered a severe injury or severe disease so rehabilitation comes under many uh, heading it's like medical rehabilitation we need to replace the uh, food uh, he has lost vocational rehabilitation we need to get him a livelihood because uh, was an athlete he lost his leg so he can't do any job so we need to give him a livelihood we need to socially rehabilitate so we need to get him back to his uh, you know, the family and social relationship because he might have a isolation isolated feeling so we need to get him back to the family circle and we need to psychologically rehabilitate we need to get back to or restore his personal dignity and his confidence so all this comes under rehabilitation so this is the last part so if disability limitation is not possible it goes to the rehabilitative phase so rehabilitative phase is nothing but a restoration of his medical social educational and vocational measures so that, so that he is able to live a highest possible level of functional with functional ability so it has all these sectors like medical vocational social and psychological rehabilitation okay so that's all about uh, the modes of intervention so we have seen health promotion uh, the various measures used in health promotion that is health education environmental modification nutritional and behavioral changes next one was specific protection we had seen it comes under immunization protection against hazards accidents and carcinogens and the secondary prevention it is early diagnosis we need to give proper active screening and finding out the disease at a very early stage then the tertiary prevention it has disability limitation so we can see the example of disability limitation we need to stop at this disability limit and let it not go to the handicap so if it is not possible then we have to rehabilitate so rehabilitation in the sense medical vocation social and psychological okay that's all about uh, the various intervention of prevention so this is nothing but the prevention but how do we apply the preventive measures so we have covered the concept of disease concept of prevention and the modes of intervention in prevention 